How Great Leaders Inspire Action Top 10 Lessons When I was preparing for this session, I had a gigantic task where I had to condense all the content I have consumed on leadership into a talk of 30 minutes. So three days ago, I came up with this presentation and I, when I was reviewing this presentation, I discovered that there were lots of jargons involved in this presentation. So I took all those jargons out because I was aware that the audience here comes from different uh, diverse backgrounds. So I wanted to make sure that it is comprehensible for everyone. So one of the challenges that we had was that we wanted to condense all the different theories of leadership and we wanted to present them in a manner which is understandable for diverse audience. Before I jump into my presentation, there are three major resources that I have used to prepare this presentation. The first one here is the work of Simon Sneak. Uh, one of the books that he's written is Start With Why and another uh, book on leadership, Why Leaders Eat Last. Um, I have also used different examples of Heiko Fisher who talks about the future of work. And finally, the most important source here is John Maxwell and his two books, uh, Good Leaders Ask Great Questions and Leader Shift. So my entire discussion uh, is based uh, on, on them and a few other resources. Before I uh, go into my top 10 lessons, there are three major assumptions that I want to uh, discuss. The first assumption that I'm taking here is that leadership is as old as life itself. The second assumption here is that leadership in one form or the other exists in all different species. So the creatures of the skies, the creatures of the oceans or the land, they all have leadership. In some cases, there are certain exceptions, but by and large, it is present in one form or the other in all species. And the third and the most common uh, assumption here is that leadership like management sciences is a social science. So uh, unlike natural sciences where we get definite answers in social sciences, there is no rule of thumb and things uh, differ from context to context. So let's dive into the top 10 lessons. This is Annie Taylor. In 1901, she crossed the Niagara Falls in a barrel. This is a barrel and just to give you a reference, this is the Niagara Falls. So she crossed the Niagara Falls in a barrel and she survived. After she had survived, the scientists wanted to study, uh, study it. They discovered that Annie was lightweight, she had leather straps around her, there was X amount of uh, uh, Newton pressure there. Based on this model, how many of you would want to cross the Niagara Falls in a barrel? Exactly, that's what I assumed, that no one would want to cross the Niagara Falls in a barrel. But this is exactly the mistake which we make in leadership. In leadership, we observe a new leader, we observe a CEO, we read a new article on leadership or read a book on leadership and we say, aha, that is our barrel. And we constrain ourselves in that framework or theory or model and we uh, are unable to go beyond that. So uh, just like Annie was able to survive in this barrel because of luck and chance and many other variables, it does not mean that someone else's leadership model will be as relevant to you as uh, in your own context. So the lesson here is that in leadership, one size does not fit all and a leader needs to develop and rather adapt his or her leadership style according to the situation, according to the team that he has and according to uh, the uh, goals that the organization has. So all leadership styles are dependent on the goals and on the team uh, and on the kind of situation you are at. This is Sir Ernest Shackleton. Sir Ernest Shackleton was one of the most famous and prominent explorers um, and that who has lived. There are several books written on his ex interesting expeditions. Uh, but I want to talk about one of the advertisements that he posted in order to recruit people for his expedition. This is his advertisement and it says, men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. Uh, 
I wonder who would read this advertisement and who would want to go on an expedition like that. But the fact here is that there were hundreds of people waiting outside Sir Ernest Shackleton's office and pleading him to take, him, to take them along uh, in this expedition. But the reason, why were people interested in joining Sir Ernest Shackleton's journey? The reason is that beyond the truth that he is talking about and beyond the honesty that he has, he was speaking in the currency of the people who wanted to join him as their team members. He was talking about the fact that if people join him in this expedition, they will be able to uh, explore different parts of the world. They will be the first people stepping their feet on this unknown grounds. So the, le and the next lesson that we have here is that great leaders inspire action by speaking in the currency of their team members, by speaking in the emotions of their team members. This is the famous Charles Darwin and often the survival of the fittest this quote is associated with Charles Darwin. However, my own research suggests that it was actually Herbert Spencer who coined this term, but that is a story for a different day. The question here is, who is the fittest? What is defined as fit? Is it the strongest? Is it the most intelligent? What is fittest? According to Charles Darwin himself, it is the species which is best able to adapt and collaborate with the environment. So those uh, people are deemed as the fittest who are best able to respond to change and adapt accordingly. And I think that's what great leaders do as well. Great leaders inspire action by uh, adapting and collaborating with others uh, and their teams and they're very open to these things. Uh, according to John uh, Maxwell, he says, the pessimist complains about the wind, the optimist expects it to change while the leader adjusts the sail. I think that in essence explains what uh, a leadership is. These days, there's a lot of emphasis on innovation. Leaders are expected to innovate, uh, whether it is about their products or the way they are managing their team members, they are expected to innovate. But in order to understand innovation, there are two major types of innovation. So here we have the Walkman which changed into a Discman and a more comprehensive one and an iPod and now probably most of us are using our phones to listen to songs. This is known as incremental innovation. But if you have your Boeing 747 and you want to put a shuttle on top, a space shuttle on top of it, then that is not incremental innovation, that is radical innovation. And for radical innovation, you need a different set of uh, principles, you need a different set of team, uh, and you need to give them different kinds of facilities. So there are these two types of important innovation, the incremental innovation and a radical innovation. Uh, often leaders find themselves in a dilemma that which kind of innovation should they go for. The incremental innovation is giving good profits. Should we abandon them? The radical innovation may or may not result into something really big for the organization. Should we go for that? However, the lesson here is that great leaders inspire action by focusing on both incremental and uh, uh, radical innovation. So this is not a question of either or for many of the great leaders. It's a question of yes and. So they take both these kinds of innovations together. Currently our organizations look a bit like this. I buy a burger for the meat and the sauce in it. This represents the people who are actually working in that organization, producing those services, producing those products. So if you are working in a school, these are your teachers. If you are working in a software house, these are those people who are writing the code and building those uh, uh, apps and websites. And if you notice, they are being squeezed by thick layers of management. The bread or the patty here represents the management, the administration, which often stifles the creativity of the people who are actually uh, working for that organization. The patty here or the bread here represents the uh, strong rules and regulations and procedures and SOPs that uh, an organization develops which often hinders creativity. How our organization needs to look like is a burrito which offers and here the management needs to be a thin layer 
that just provides enough stability so that things don't spill on you. But often at times we notice that organizations look like this and when they look like this then according to the famous Russian proverb they pretend to pay us and we pretend to work and this is a recipe for disaster that's not how we want our organizations to go. How, I, how we want our organizations to be as I've mentioned is like a burrito a thin layer of management that provides just enough stability but then the question is that what is this thin layer of stability these are three major concepts which represent the modern day management the first one is democracy democratic way of decision making the second one is free flow of information and the third one is fair gain sharing based on these three principles the entire management today rests and that's what great leaders do as well great leaders inspire action by creating systems that promote democratic decision making allow free flow of information and provide fair gains similarly our approach to managing people has also changed uh, we because we are expecting innovation from our leaders uh, the way we manage our people needs to differ as well so this is bob balmer he is, was the CEO of Microsoft. He believes that the more you sweat, the more you are working, the more you are working, the more you are sweating. But this represents the predictability uh, phase. But if you want to innovate, you need to go into the complex and unpredictability stage. So the problem here is that we are preparing our students and leaders in this phase, but we expect them to go here. And that is the major difference here. This is the zone of predictability of operations of procedures. However, this zone is of complexity, unpredictability and innovation. But the important lesson here is that here we manage our human resource. However, in this zone, we manage resourceful humans, which is drastically different. So the lesson here is that great leaders inspired by shifting their focus from managing human resource to managing resourceful humans. So in essence, uh, great leaders have an invisible yet strong inner circle which helps them execute their plans. Currently, most of our organizations look like this, a very centralized structures. Some good organizations look like this, decentralized structures, but what is needed is a distributed management system, which is very rare. But when it happens, it is one of the most beautiful things that you can observe. And one of my favorite uh, football clubs, the Barcelona Football Club, actually implemented this program called the Total Football, whereby they equipped the schools with the right equipment, with the right coaches, and helped them uh, build a structure which is distributed, yet uh, which, has, which uses all the information of the system. So a distributed management system, what it does is it has good databases where in which it uses the strengths and weaknesses of all the team players working in that environment. So great leaders inspire action by creating distributed systems and structures. According to Simon Sneak, uh, great leaders start with why. And we often see leaders make this mistake as well because their focus often comes on what, what are they producing, how are they producing and then their focus goes into why. However, Simon Sneak says that you should start with why because why represents motivation, why represents the purpose, how represents the process whereas what represents the kind of product or service you are using uh, to fulfill your purpose. So, according to Simon, great leaders start with why. This is Henry Ford, uh, the founder of Ford Motors uh, and the first person to come up with the idea of producing uh, motor vehicles in an assembly line. This is the famous Steve Jobs, uh, Jeff Bezos, founder of Amazon, uh, Sergey Brin, uh, one of the co-founders of Google, Elon Musk, several companies but Tesla being the most famous one and this is Sher Wang uh, who is the CEO of HTC. If you look at all these people, let me go through them once again. Henry Ford, uh, born of Irish parents. Uh, Steve Jobs, his biological father was from Syria. Uh, Jeff Bezos, I always used to wonder about this name Bezos but his parents are from Cuba. Uh, Sergey Brin, uh, his parents are from Russia. Elon Musk, as we all know, uh, comes from South Africa. 
and Sher Wang uh, has a Taiwanese background. So all these great leaders at some point moved from their comfort zone to another zone, a more difficult uh, landscape where they had to navigate their way through. So one of the things that great leaders do and the way they inspire action is by celebrating the grilling and grinding they have received over the years. They celebrate that, they cherish it instead of being embarrassed. So great leaders inspire action by cherishing the grilling and grinding they have received in their lives. They like to talk about it, they like to mention it to their team members and try to inspire others through the hardships they have received. In the literature there are two important analogies that often get used uh, with the leaders. The first one is of a plumber. A good plumber uses his intuition which is usually based in science because there is a bit of science involved here as to what tool will do what. A good plumber also uses some of his guesswork which is based on uh, experience and a bunch of trial and error methods to solve a particular problem. And that is exactly what a great leader does as well. A great leader inspires action by a combination of intuition grounded in science, some guesswork aided by experience and a bunch of pure trial and error methods because there is no rule of thumb in leadership. The second analogy that gets used in the field of leadership is of a farmer or of a gardener because a gardener and a farmer nourishes life. But a good gardener has certain attributes. A good gardener, gardener is hard headed about facts. He or she is skeptical about simple answers and a good gardener also will do implement new ideas, will be wrong at times, will admit that he or she is wrong as long as it gives good produce at the end of the day. And that's exactly what a good leader does too. Great leaders often uh, are hard headed about facts, they are skeptical about sleek answers and magic bullets, willing to try new ideas and solutions and even be wrong as long as it takes them and it helps them build a more humane organization. But now the question here is that what is a humane organization? Who is a more humane leader? Great leaders inspire action through empathy. Their ability to understand the emotions of others and where they are standing right now. Integrity, holding on to their values. Perseverance, their ability to start something and bring it to an end. And a valor, that is courage, that is needed uh, among great leaders. I want to uh, end my talk uh, with a famous quote from John Maxwell. And I want to give you a mental exercise to think about these three questions as well. John Maxwell says that a great leader is one who knows the ways, who goes the ways and who shows the ways. And in your own teams where you are leading right now, I want you to ask this question to yourself. Do you know the way you are taking your team? Are you willing to go that way with your team as well? And are you willing to show that way to your audience and team members? Thank you very much.